An hour passed, during which Spike Thomas waited as patiently as Patsy, on the opposite corner, patiently watched him. At the end of that time, Spike showed by his action and his vigilance that the person or persons for whom he had watched had come into view. Presently, two men crossed from the lower side of 34th Street to the corner where Spike was standing, and as they passed him, carelessly nodded to him. Spike spoke to them, and they halted. What passed between them, of course, Patsy could not tell, but it evidently ended in an invitation to drink on the part of one of the two strangers, a man who, in his outward appearance, looked like everything else but a thief and burglar. As Patsy was preparing to follow, he suddenly became aware that a man had stopped on the pavement immediately in front of him and was regarding the group across the street most intently. Looking at this man closely, Patsy quickly recognized a celebrated detective from Chicago. Stepping up to him, Patsy called him by name, revealing himself to the Chicago sleuth. What do you know of those men over there? he asked. Are you after them? asked the Chicago man in return. I am after the one who's on the corner that they spoke to. He is Spike Thomas, a New York crook, second story man. That dressy man that's talking to him, said the Chicago man, is Jimmy Lanigan, the swell crackman of Philadelphia. He's the best lockman in the world. I was surprised to see him here, for I supposed he was in St. Louis. He was in Chicago all last winter, and while we suspected him of several jobs, we couldn't fix it on him. By this time, the three men had entered the liquor saloon on the corner, and Patsy said, I'd like to talk to you a little longer, but I must get closer to those people. He slipped across the avenue, and the Chicago sleuth went his way. Peering into the saloon, Patsy saw the three men standing in a little group at the bar. There was no one else in the saloon, and Patsy did not dare to enter lest his appearance should be noted but he did see that Spike Thomas was urging something strongly on the one the Chicago sleuth had called Lanigan. And he heard the latter say in a rather loud voice, We can't talk about it here. Let's go to another place. Patsy retired from the door and took such a position on the corner that he could observe both the front and the rear doors. In a few minutes, the three men appeared at the front door and, turning the corner, walked down 34th Street in the direction of the East River. Patsy sauntered after them. It was not a difficult matter to keep them in sight, although from time to time both Thomas and Lanigan looked behind them. Patsy thought it was more because of habit than in a belief they were being followed. Their way took them to the last block of the street, and here they turned into a saloon which was well filled with customers and where they could easily talk without attracting attention. At the rear of the saloon in the corner was a table and some chairs. At it, Spike Thomas, Lanigan, and his companion sat down and immediately entered into a close conversation. In the beginning, the talk was almost entirely conducted by Spike Thomas, Lanigan's replies seemingly being a series of denials. By and by, Patsy drifted to the table next to the party, but which was still some little distance from it too far away indeed to hear what was being said by the three as they talked in a low tone. What are you giving me? I know you was into it, and you had a right to take me in. It's no way to treat a pal. I got something up me sleeve, and if you don't take me in under level, I'll make trouble for you. Lanigan merely laughed and called for some more drinks but the third man was evidently inclined to regard seriously the threat conveyed in Spike's words. Speaking to Lanigan in a low tone, he rose from his seat and took Lanigan apart and talked earnestly and vigorously. Whatever it was that was said made an impression upon Lanigan, and he turned abruptly and went back to the table. See here, Spike, said Lanigan. You don't want to do anything ugly until you know what you're doing. Billy and I can't talk with you until we've been across the river. We'll be back inside of an hour and see you right here. If there's a whack into anything, you'll get your share. The two tossed off their drinks and, rising, immediately left the saloon. Spike Thomas remained at the table, looking, as Patsy thought, much dissatisfied with the outcome. 
Anyhow, said Patsy, Spike will remain here for an hour or two. Suddenly, Patsy rose to his feet and sauntered from the saloon. He ran up the street hastily and turned the corner. Half an hour later, a young fellow, rather jauntily dressed, but nevertheless one in whom the east side tough showed, came down the street and turned into the saloon where Spike was awaiting the return of Lanigan and his companion. What about them lines you has got? These are right, if you know who did the job, replied Morris. Suppose I did it myself, said Spike with a wink. Why not? Cause the job was done before one o'clock this morning, and use was with your rag down to Rivington Street along about that time. Spike gave a huge wink and smiled a knowing smile. I'm kinder onto it myself, said Morris. Spike gave such a start as made Morris say, That's the way you think, too. Well, I got a squint that way, reluctantly admitted Spike. Well, their first one is that Nick Carter's in the case and Patsy Murphy with him. I got that line myself, said Spike. I knows Patsy this long time. I seed him this morning, and I tumbled to the job. Well, here's a line you ain't got. The lags took out of the house a case with some papers in it what's worth more than 50 times what all the other things is. What's that you're giving me? asked Spike roughly. It's this. Some big feller in the dark put up the job of getting the lags to get hold of that case. They put up for it, but nothing like what it's worth. Why, man, there's thousands and thousands in that case, and there's more than one dad that would put up big for it. The same place where you got your line, said Morris. Patsy Murphy? The same. How did he come to do that? That's what he's looking for, said Morris. You see, he's looking for that and nothing else. You know Patsy is an east sider, and he tackled me to know if I knew who did the job. Then he'd give all his insides to me about it. Yes, he did, said Spike incredulously. That's right, he did. And he said that he was talking with you before he seen me, and if he hadn't been a chump, he'd split to you to see if you wouldn't give him a pointer on the fellers into the job. Holy gee, it's a plant. The cull is painted for me. Patsy Murphy, Molly Morris, replied Patsy, for it was Patsy. I didn't think I'd run up again you so far away from the Bowery. But come along till I get this makeup off me. Nothing that'll hurt you, replied Patsy. But if you'll play up to the line, it may put some dollars in your pocket. Patsy found on the corner below a drinking place and, going into the washroom, quickly removed the makeup that had made him look like Bolly Morris. Then he took Billy into the bar room and told him just what he had done in his disguise. Now, Billy, he said in conclusion, I haven't made you do anything that'll hurt you or anyone else. You see, he continued, I'm trying to stop that case from going into the hands of people that, if it ever reaches them, can't be got out of by the right owners. When the real Bolly Morris comprehended the whole scheme, he was quite willing to fall into it and do as Patsy wanted him to do, since there was no danger for him but a chance of profit. Are you going to be on the level with me? asked Patsy. Why shouldn't I be? replied Morris. There ain't anything in it for me any other way. Then, said Patsy, get down to that place and watch Spike. And meet me on the other corner an hour from now. Wait for me until I come. Patsy hastened to report, for he believed that he had made most important discoveries. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.